Yo, what's up? You're hanging with the beast. Welcome to another episode of Give Me Back My 90s Music. That intro was from the artist Poppy, who opened up the uh, show for the Smashing Pumpkins and Jane's Addiction when I saw them last Wednesday on the 19th at MSG. And uh, I never had heard of her before. I saw her name on the venue. I was kind of wondering who the hell she was uh, or who the hell they were. I didn't know if it was uh, female or whatever. The only thing I did know was Poppy's what I call my grandfather on my father's side. Uh, So that was interesting. But uh, I got to say, man, that song that you just heard is called Blood Money and it is fucking kick ass. She's kick ass. She's fucking hot, too, man. Small little thing. But uh, she's got some great outfits. She's got some really cool stage work, some really cool music. If you get a chance, definitely give her a listen. Uh, my middle brother, Steve, because we're, uh, you know, all things 90s music fucking animals. We had both never seen Smashing Pumpkins before. He had seen Jane's Addiction before. I had never. We both agreed that Poppy is real similar, in our opinion, to like uh, the Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor. Has a little bit of that going on. Has a little bit of uh, something. I don't really. It's, I don't make this um, connection in terms of like musical. I guess style but the way that she presented herself on stage kind of remi- with the lights and the costumes and everything reminded me a little bit of uh marilyn manson a little bit motionless and a little bit rob zombie too but it had like more of like a a hip-hop thing to it a dark hip-hop thing to it i would say more nine inch nails than anything she was phenomenal man i've been listening to her a lot i have a roll over my my uh, playlist i sent that song out to a million people man blood money the fucking lyrics are just crazy obviously it sounds like some type of like i don't know be make a great film and a movie for like a fight scene when some uh some chick you know gets done wrong and she gets up and starts whipping whipping all types of candy ass all over the place but yeah man uh definitely check out the videos of her live in concert like i said she's got some great uh stage costumes kind of reminds me a little bit of david bowie too with the costumes you know she's always kind of uh comes different to the venue different color hair different color venue the night i saw her she had like a black skirt on i don't know i i I couldn't tell if it was her actual skin but she had like two big uh you know like those stars on her on her nipples man which i gotta say look pretty good to me um but yeah man she was great uh what a way to kick off the show man what like a what a what a um what an honor must have been for her to work with like two phenomenal bands such as Jane's Addiction and Smashing Pumpkins. That being said, I was really excited about this show because, again, I've never seen uh, Jane's Addiction and Smashing Pumpkins in concert. And it's funny, I've had so many people in the past talk about how they saw Smashing Pumpkins back in the day. And it was this sort of like underlining rumor, sort of like underlining information going around that they sucked live, that he, Billy Corgan couldn't sing live whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, I never go by that because I just go by what I see, what I hear. Uh, I wish the refs in the NFL would do the same, but that doesn't happen. I'm digressing. Anyway, um, yeah, man. So I've been watching a lot of the videos from the the, the uh, tour that Smashing Pumpkins have been headlining since the summer and now. And I got to say, I've been so impressed with the way they've sounded, especially vocally and musically, that I think they sound even better than they ever did. And a lot of the times what you can do is you can go see a band live or a single live and you really can get the appreciation for them there as terms of music, in terms of uh, vocal I think that's always the best way to do it as opposed to just listening to it on vinyl, on CD, on tape, whatever the fuck people listen to, you know, these days. But it's really the best way to do it. So that being said, uh, always going to see a band you've never seen, bands, I should say, you've never seen that were very prominent during the 90s and still going on is always a great thing. And that's another thing I really hold close to my heart is that Jane's Addiction and uh, for anyone who knows their shit, Jane's Addiction and, 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 you know, uh, the, the pumpkins were huge during the 90s more the pumpkins than obviously Jane's Addiction but the important thing about Jane's Addiction was that they were really at the forefront of this whole grunge thing I mean a lot of their hits came in the late 80s and you know they had been around for so long before that same thing could be said for the Smashing Pumpkins who were around before that 
uh, and, you know, gained a lot of notoriety in the 90s where they had so many, so many hits. It's funny, during the show, uh, they had the set list out. I cheated. I wanted to see what was next. I, I was, my ADD was kicking in and I just couldn't be patient, although I don't have caffeine or coffee late at night. But still, um, you know, I wanted just to see what they had coming up. And, um, the, the, I, you know, you sit there sometimes and you say to yourself, man, like, this band has endless amounts of hits, man. I mean, from from zero to you know, obviously 1979 to night to night, uh, bullet with butterfly wings, um, mayonnaise, uh, rhinoceros, which they did not do, which I was pissed, uh, I was angry about. Um, Disarm today, uh, you know, the the it just keeps on coming, and you really you really appreciate them more when you see their large catalog. So. Getting to go over their set list was something very interesting. And, you know, you just said, he said, wow, I mean, they've been together for so long, over 30 years, and the hits just keep on coming. But phenomenal show. I know they're still on tour. They had gone from the USB Arena, where the shitty Islanders play, and had gone to MSG, which I got to say, they really made MSG up really nice. Um, haven't been in there since, uh, since I saw, uh, Ranger Islanders game last season, but it looks nice. Uh, not the greatest place for a concert because of the seating, but in terms of sound, uh, it really does, uh, 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 reach all those, those areas. I, um, so I was really interested to see Jane's Addiction. I never saw them. Obviously, like I said, they were at the forefront, you know, starting from 19, the mid-1980s and whatnot. And I got to say, man, they sounded tight as a drum. Uh, Perry Farrell hasn't lost anything on vocals. Um, you know, they, they were they, – Dave Navarro was wailing it. The whole band was – what a tight, tight group, man. Um, you know, it, it was, a, it was a, a phenomenal show. It really was. Uh, and just – you know, it was funny because I think one of the last songs they played was Got Caught Stealing. And I looked at my brother. I'm like, you remember when this video used to be playing like on an endless loop on MTV or the box of VH1? Like this was that famous video you always saw that always seemed to be playing. And then, of course, you know, how many times do you always hear Jane says on the radio, whether it's on Lithium or on the other 90 station, uh, preferably the steel drum version, which is a lot better. And we were just talking about how well uh, his 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 uh, Perry Farrell's vocals were, and it was funny. We were wondering. I wonder if they're going they're going to delve into any, um, you know, maybe they were going to do some porno for Pyro's hits, you know, uh, Pets or Hard Charger from the Howard Stern Private Parts soundtrack, but they didn't. Um, but, but nevertheless, they sounded great, man. And uh, like I said, it was a phenomenal show. And just going back over a lot of their hits and hearing uh, 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 their, uh, you know, the music, it just kind of reminded me of so many different things going on, man. Um, you know, again, the I, I guess what, what really sticks out the most is the fact that they only really had four studio albums. I mean, that first album in 88 of Nothing Shocking, the two chicks kind of like stuck together at the shoulder with the big ass chest and shit like that. Just with the flames on their head, that kind of thing that they were showing that all over the, uh, all over the, uh, the video screen too, by the way, that was like their first, their first uh, album. And of course, like off there came so many different hits. And if you look them up, that album up, you'll see that that, you know, really put them on the map. All lyrics written by Perry Farrell. You know, he doesn't get his due as a vocal lead man or as a writer. I mean, really, really cerebral guy. He's from Queens, by the way, too, which is amazing. Um, obviously, some of the songs that came off their Mountain Song, which they did, which sounded great. Uh, Jane Says, you know, um, I mean, you know, Obviously, a band that uh, I want to say that I think, and this being, let's see, <clears throat> 1988, it's released, and they were before their time. They, they, which is which is really interesting because it carried over into the 90s. I think a lot more. Obviously, their second album, Ritual uh, De La Habitual, was released in 1990, and of course, from uh, you know from 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 that uh, uh, album came uh, some more great singles like stop and court stealing um but still 
you know, they were at the forefront of this whole grunge thing. They had been in it for so long. I met a gentleman there that night who was telling me how he had seen them. Oh, God. I forgot how many years ago. Some small club in, um, I, be, I don't know, in Jersey or something like that. And uh, which was really interesting because, uh, you know, it, 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 it really opened your eyes to the fact how long they've been around. Sometimes you don't appreciate that, you know. And obviously they had that break. Uh, once Perry Farrell left and went on to form Porno for Pyros, and then Dave Navarro left, he went on to join Red Hot Chili Peppers when John Frusciante had left that band. They did the album One Hot Minute, which is a phenomenal album. Um, yeah, man, and then they came back together now, and all these years later, and they're still doing it. They've been to, they've been together for so long. Uh, and again, just going back over their, their catalog of music, you appreciate it so much more, but I, I always felt like they were the band that didn't get their due. They're one of those bands that just didn't get their due. And for, I don't know for whatever reason it is, but that's just the way it, it felt. Um, but like I said, they were great. I had never seen them before. Um, really, really tight. Uh, no, it was a badass cool thing I got to say, man. I did like a triple take. They, were, uh, they had a whole bunch of these hot ass strippers come out and just dance all over the place. I'm like, damn, that's pretty fucking interesting. If you're gonna keep your eye on some shit, put put that out there. That that'll that'll get your your attention going. It sure did for me, you know. Made the the, the many well not the many but the light bulbs in my brain just go blinkity blink. Fucking, you know. Uh, <sighs> Con Edison. I had to speak to them. My bill was high, but um, they were really good. They played for about an hour. Did a lot of the hits. Um, he's very entertaining, Perry Farrell. If you've ever seen him live, he's got that. Very interesting, like high pitched voice, yet it's kind of like raspy. It definitely sounds like a New York thing. You can really appreciate that about him, too, as he's a New York guy at heart. Uh, and of course, the headliner was the Smashing Pumpkins, who I'd never seen before, as I've said. And again, you know, how can you not be a fan of theirs? I mean, look, the in the in all things in the, in the original group. They were tight as could be, you know, Billy Corrigan, James Eha, Jimmy Chamberlain, Darcy Bretsky, who I always thought was really hot, by the way. Um, in the 90s, man, you couldn't go anywhere. I mean, I, I remember all the merch that was selling uh, was amazing. Every every It always seemed to me that either the radio or MTV, VH1, or the, the uh, yeah, pretty much those two stations were always playing. Uh, the Today video, or always playing the Disarm video that starts with that little like clowny thing, kind of flippity flopping backwards and shit like that. I remember buying Siamese Dream on cassette and trying to, mainly because of uh, a Cherub Rock, which they did do, which was sounded phenomenal live. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they were, they are such a different band that came along at that time. It's very hard to place them because you can't really put them in any one given area. Like you have the industrial rock and you go towards more nine inch nails, you know, a little bit of Marilyn Manson in there. And then you have the classic more uh, grunge rock, I guess you would say as it would be Pearl Jam, the Seattle sound, Alice in Chains, um, you know, a sound garden and whatnot. And then you have, uh, you got your LA, your LA groups like STP and whatnot, and then you have your carryovers from the '80s, Guns and Roses, and all these things going on. Then you have them. It's 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 a it's a very different sound, and I would never want to make the comparison with them to Green Day because they're very different. Green Day was more punkish. Smashing Pumpkins really established their own sound. I think a lot of that has to do a with the really tight musicianship that they had between all four of them and B because of Billy Corrigan being a very intelligent and cerebral musician. If you've ever heard him speak on a podcast, I mean, that guy has contributed so much to music, not only the Smashing Pumpkins, but to Zwan and Hole and so many other, so many other bands. It's amazing all the songs they've written, but I got to say, man, they were phenomenal. They were absolutely phenomenal. They had a 20-song set, lasted for about two hours. They had um, actually had to run out of there a little early, which I hate to do. So I didn't get to see the um, them come back on. But um, just, again, you know, going, going through their catalog that night was just, damn, that Darcy Retsky was hot. There's a nice picture, huh? Um. Yeah, I mean, how could you not be a fan of theirs, man? 
You know, I think sometimes a lot of bands and singers get such a bad name because it's the cool thing to do. Uh, but I got to tell you this, man, James E. Howard is one hell of a guitarist. I have a newfound respect for J Billy Corgan on guitar. He fucking wails. Uh, Jimmy Chamberlain is a phenomenal drummer, man. If you've never appreciated him, go tell him you go to see him live, look at some of his solos. And they obviously have this uh, Jeff Schroeder filling in uh, on guitars and keyboard, new member of the band, as uh, the Darcy Rescue is no longer part of them. But, you know, you look at all the awards they won, whether it was Best Alternative Artist in 97, you know, the Grammy Awards for Bullet with Butterfly Wings, The End is the Beginning is the End. That's another thing they have. They've had some um, phenomenal names for songs and albums. The End is the Beginning is the End, Ava Adore. Uh, you know, Bullet with Butterfly Wings, La Machina, The Machines of God. I mean, some of the some of the best uh, names for stuff, man. Obviously, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness is what just blew everything out of the fucking out of the game. But of course, like you know, their first album, Gish, um, again ninety one, it gets released in. So they're right at the forefront of this of this sound that that that's coming. And, uh, you know, obviously they've been together for, uh, for a long time before that. That's where that, that song Rhinoceros came from. Great song. If you've never heard that, man, that's a real tight early, uh, smashing pumpkins tune. And then of course, Siamese dream, the second album came in 93, which is, which is all things great album. Cherub rock today, the Psalm rocket. I mean, that's another song they did that night. It's, 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 it's kick ass man all over the place. And again, um, the band is so tight. They're one of the, again, I have to say they're one of those bands that don't get their due. And I forget how many albums they've, they've sold. I mean, you're talking this album, it's, 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 you know, over 5 million uh, and more worldwide. And that, who God knows how many more that is uh, uh, these days. But um, a great album. And like I said, then comes Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness two years later. So within that four-year time frame, they released you know two albums, one double album, which back in the day, man, when, when this album came out back in the day, I sound like a fucking, I hate when people say it. I sound like a fucking caveman, whatever. First of all, they had one of the best art, art covers for that album. Okay, I remember a couple cats that had that uh, in high school, uh, that album. And, you know, you would just, it was a double CD. It was cool. All the hits came from there. Bullet with Butterfly Wings, 1979, Tonight, Tonight, Zero, 33, 33, such a good song. They didn't do that, by the way. But it is just an absolute ass kicker of an album. It, it, it's got to go, it's it's up there probably, um, probably in, in one of the greatest albums ever, I would think, in that long list of uh of, you know, of albums that whoever wants to consider the best of all time, it's got to be in there. I mean, on on sales alone, just going over the charts, man, uh, it, it was it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it was in how long it was it was up there in the high numbers for forever. It seemed like um, nothing could ever shake that it sold well over five million albums and then some the videos for their music was phenomenal my brother and i were talking about tonight tonight's one of the best videos of all time the way they kind of blended that old school movie theme of a silent film 1979 kind of obviously remind you of someone's childhood um by the way on the note of tonight tonight they did that in acoustic version it was amazing i spoke about the disarm video i spoke about the today video with the ice cream truck I mean, they had they they put together just such large packages of great artwork that you I think it, it can be appreciated for all time, uh, for now and many years to come. Adore in 1998, uh, underrated album I think had that hot chick on the front, kind of like looking up, all dark and shit like that. Ava Adore, phenomenal song, phenomenal video, uh, a lot a lot different I think than uh, Melancholy and the Infinite Sand is something that you really have to appreciate for a band sometimes the way they try to get away from whatever it is they're categorized of and you know don't have their original sound and get away from that and then of course came uh, Mocking of the Machines of God and Mocking the Two the Friends and Enemies of Music I kind of lost touch with them after a door to be to be to be interesting uh, to be uh, truthful but I always thought that the names of these albums were very interesting and this of course like this is when things started to, I guess, I guess kind of change for them. Uh, obviously the band started to change. They had some, uh, some, some changes as many bands go, go 
happened. You know, Darcy Redsky wasn't in the band no more. And then they broke up from 2000 to 2007, which they uh, came back with Zeitgeist, which I've never heard, to be honest. Never listened to the album. Um, but I remember when they were touring with that. And then, of course, they released uh, Oceana, Monuments to an Elegy, Shiny and Oh So Bright, Seer, which they sung during the show. Very good song. They actually have a... Uh, a new album coming, uh, a, a tune, a rock opera in three acts. But, you know, the catalog is so huge. And it's so funny, too, that you see, again, I always I always say this, but you see so many of their songs in so many phenomenal movies, you know. Um, and it just kind of... It just kinds of show you that certain certain acts, certain bands, certain artists are are here to stay forever, and it's such a good thing, and it's such an even better thing for us of all fans from the '90s because we know that that's that was one of the most uh, important times of music that we've ever seen, and it's so good to see Smashing Pumpkins, Jane's Addiction, Pearl Jam. Uh, all these bands still going strong live. Live is actually going to be at the Paramount in Huntington, Long Island. I'm definitely going to be there. I've never seen them live. I've never seen live live. How about that definition? Anyway, no, I've never seen them. Also, too, um, other bands, too. Godsmack, Disturbed. All, you know, even though Disturbed was a little past that. Rob Zombie. It's always a great thing to see all these bands going, man. But... If you didn't have a chance to go on, uh, go see them live or you've seen them live before, I don't know, for some reason or another, maybe you think you caught them on a bad night. I'm telling you, man, they're tight as ever. Sometimes a band is like wine. They get better with age. His Billy Corrigan's voice has not suffered at all. He sounded phenomenal. He was very lively. He wailed on guitar. James Eha a phenomenal guitar player, like I said. The band is ever so tight. They give you two hours worth. They give you a great catalog of music. This is a really, really, really good tour. I was happy to actually see them. So definitely check uh, out Poppy for sure, man, because she's absolutely kick-ass. So I've able, I've been blessed to able to have two back-to-back concerts in a very short time, Johnny Depp and Jeff Beck, and then uh, this one. And like I said, I want to definitely check out Live, who's going to be at the Paramount. Uh, concerts are where it's at, man, depending on the venue, depending on, uh, who you're seeing, you can really appreciate a certain band. Can a band or a singer have an off night? Of course, man, they're only human. Their voice can be sore. Maybe they were singing the night before. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're under the weather. I've seen so many concerts where the guy tells you, or the lady tells you not feeling too good tonight. I have to sit down. All right. My voice is off. So please excuse me while the band sings this one. Hey, it happens. What can you do, man? Especially when you've been doing that for, for, all this time and several years and whatnot. So yeah, this is a great show, man. I got a chance to see one of the, one of uh, what I consider to be one of the all time. They they are, you have to put the smashing pumpkins in there. They when, when, when everything is done, they'll be one of the all time bands that stood the test of time and just kept going. And again, like I said, Billy Corrigan, man, you know, look at his body of work. I mean, the guy, the guy is, um, just a phenomenal, just a, a unit, man. Yeah, just like an, a nonstop machine, man. If you go and just look at the many things that he's done, look at the solo albums that uh, he's worked on, man. The Future Embrace. I've never heard any of these two, I must admit. A, I'm going to fucking totally butcher this one. Aegea, Ugly Lala, Cotta Lions. Uh, and then look at the soundtracks he's worked on. The movie Ransom with Mel Gibson. Stigmata, which is a phenomenal movie. Any Given Sunday. Spawn, great movie. Uh, Rampage, obviously. Uh, that I guess that's the movie with The Rock there. And he's featured on so many different albums. So, like, just look in Celebrity Skin. It says, Corrigan is credited as co-writer of Celebrity Skin. Hit so hard. Malibu, Dying in Petals. Some great songs there. Uh, I Belong to You, single by Lenny Kravitz. Mechanical Animals, Marilyn Manson. Uh, who else? Iomi by Tony Iomi. Uh, Kiss in Time, Marianne Faithful. Lights Out, Lisa Marie Presley. Corrigan is credited as the writer of Savior. That I got to listen to. Breaking Benjamin, We Are Not Alone, The Essential Cheap Trick. He plays the guitar on the live recording of the track Mandicello. I mean, it just keeps on going and going and going. Scorpions, Nobody's Door to Hole. Uh, it's another album I got to revisit. 
it, like I said, it just keeps on going. The guy is just part of, he's all over the place, man. And again, listen to him in interviews. He's extremely cerebral, very smart musically and otherwise. Uh, also, he also owns National Wrestling Alliance, man. Uh, NWA. That is awesome. I think he had a wrestler come out during the show and like two chicks, two wrestling, big, these big wrestling chicks come out and just beat the shit out of each other, which was really funny. But yeah, man, like I said, um, they're, they're a phenomenal band. I would love to see them again. It's actually has me revisiting so many of their songs and their music. And also too, look into his lyrics because his lyrics are phenomenal. Um, you really appreciate them a lot more once you've revisited the artist and kind of see them live. So yeah, man, it, it was a great show. Uh, like I said, I'm just happy I got the chance to see another band that I never have seen before, uh, especially that was huge during the 90s. All right, that's about it for now. Going to take you guys out with some more of a Poppy Blood Money live version. Uh, hit me up on uh, Give Me Back My 90s Music uh, page on Instagram, but anything you want. Also, if you get a chance, go to the YouTube page and subscribe. I appreciate it. Peace. To the bank, it's a grab and can't always grab what they take. Do you believe? When you're not watching, what do you believe?